mi mi lusi mi pinis, mi lusi mi susu, mi go wobati ora sem mangi. Na mi go wobati kama tem papa blomina, mi luki mi wepra man. Mi luki mi na mi no luku luku stret, mi plet no kutru, na mi wok lo krai krai. ว่ากระดาษอยู่ไอ้เบี้ยงคนไหนมันขันเจนนั่งกิ้งอยู่ก็กบารุยบาปไหนมีบาปเพียรอะไรเพียรเพียรอะไรหนูรู้บ้างอ
particularly mad about the people. But anyhow, I stayed there. And when I stayed there, I stayed there for the benefit of James Levy Lay. Uh, and I didn't do too badly for him. But I stayed there for 50 years. When the gold rush broke out in New Guinea and, and Mick left Australia to come to the gold rush, I, would, I had just left school and was, uh, it was in the middle of the Depression and I had got a job up in North Queensland working on a dairy farm. Well, my only thoughts from then, after I'd learnt that Mick had gone and the gold rush, was to get to New Guinea and be doing the same things as Mick was doing. A lot of people say that Mick had the gold fever. Well, we all had it. So you can imagine what terrific excitement it was that I was at last almost on my way to the promised land. Spurred on by dreams of another great gold strike, Michael Lay turned to prospecting. The obvious place to look for new gold was the interior, where no European had ever been before. In 1930, the interior of New Guinea was one of the last great unexplored regions then left on the face of the earth. Rising up in the centre of the island was a great mountain range, so sheer and rugged it was thought to be uninhabited. But unknown to the outside world, within these mountains were huge and fertile valleys, and in these valleys lived one million people. Michael Lay and his companions were the first white men to enter this hidden world and meet its people. Lay was looking for gold, but he took a camera with him, and so a record of this historic encounter was captured on film. The year was 1930. <laughs> <coughs> Mick was always the leader of our party. He always went in the lead. He was a born prospector, I think, you know, he, and, uh, and uh, he was a very, very good organiser, and he got very well with all the native people. The carriers all looked up to Mick as the leader. But he was very kind, but he was very hard at the same time. Mick was always confident we would find the El Dorado before we had finished our travels. As long as there's a creek further up the valley that no one else has had a look at, that's a good enough driving force for anyone. But it was very, very hard. When you're right out in the centre, there was no way of getting back, only the way you came. For about 90 miles, we had to walk to get to the place where we decided to cross the ranges. Well, then we had to climb up to 9, 10, 11,000 feet. The reward in the end was when we looked down into the valleys below, it looked like a big parkland. Of course, it was quite uh, obvious that there was a huge population because of the huge garden patches. When we got into the real new country, we used to hear them on the top of these hills, singing out to the people ahead. And then you'd hear it much further away on another hillside, 
been uh, repeated. They'd be watching you come and they'd be on a little hill in some place on top of a gully or something. And they'd see that we weren't the enemy coming up, that we were different, absolutely different. I thought we were spirits. We were so different to anything that they had ever seen before because they had never ever dreamt that anything like us existed. They had no idea of civilization or what existed outside their part of the world. Man, <laughs> I go to Hapna. This is the time I was looking at something. 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 I was looking at at We'd get into camp and we'd put all the cargo in the, in the centre and we'd put this fish line right around and no one was allowed inside there. Well, then you'd get all the mob would sort of converge in on you all around then. They were very inquisitive about anything you did or anything you touched. The only thing we could do was to talk in signs to them. We didn't know a word of their language. We had no means of communication. We had no interpreters. Now, all the Karim the so tablo gore ori tok ori no kriya kutiro re sarana ori tok e moro kari meri bro gore pluma pinro pirum na kari na ol pasim gaborab na pasim ret na painat istablo hab na e moro tok oro meri no ken lukim oro meri no ken lukim em kok bro re sarana oro rai niya iro plato masina raunim 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 na Ori hai tim. Ori hai tim. Ori hai tim. Ori hai tim. Ori hai Ori hai tim. 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 Ori hai tim.
You'd have these hundreds of them all around you all day, yelling and shouting and rushing up and down. And uh, sometimes I used to feel about four or five hairs go out of the back of my leg and I'd look around and the fellow would be wrapping up, up in a banana leaf. Sometimes you'd see them pinching the hair out of the dog's back. Or anything that we touched, even if you spat along the road, there'd be a stampede to get it. On several occasions, we'd come into a village, and all of a sudden there'd be a woman rushing and grab one of the arm boys we had with us. And apparently, he had a very strong resemblance to her son that had been killed in one of the tribal wars. It looked as though she was dead sure that it was her son that had come back. Or she thought it was her son appearing back from the dead. In the beginning, they thought that we were spirits that had brought these people back. We couldn't speak to the people, and it was very hard to get away from that village. They'd say, stay here and we'll be anything you want you can have. We'd say, oh, no, we don't want to stay in the one place. We're looking for gold. Well, you'd leave the Marys there still weeping, and uh, we'd just move on then to the next place. They wouldn't follow us very far. In some cases, they wouldn't be able to follow us very far on account of the uh, boundaries. You know, it might be the enemy country further on. We used to look for a campsite about 12 o'clock because in the afternoons, when you usually get the afternoon rains, and we'd like to have our camp and everything up before the rains came. Well, by the time we had the camp up and everything went up, there was a huge lot of people around. And of course, we had our boys just to buy the food. Now, Piggy, me, put up my cream, and I talk. Oh, you put a go kiss him. Me, you show him something, and I talk. You put a kiss him, Piggy, come. Me, put a mocking pig or the same. Pig or the same, no, em or he kiss him. What did Donny go? Donny go now, kiss him. One para piggy mama, and he kiss me cam. What he kiss me cam? What he broke him corn? What he broke him kiss him cow cow? What he kiss me cam? Em na, me para buy him now. Buy him now, kiri kiri. Na piggy buy him now, kumo kumo. Na broke him rap rap. Diki diki. You know broke him beef para rap rap para passing. でもそれ何サプラオロカナカイ入ってなるグルゴリゴペペッピニスおりかめとけもろまんのエベネオリゴペペクルセラハピナオリブシムネスラペレソリカラピゴピニスロハプロカフコイゴルセモラサロプランティ
attacking, and we'll do the same to you as we did to the pig, because we've got the guns to do it. You leave our stuff alone, and we'll leave your stuff alone. We're just looking for these stones in the creek beds as we go along. That's all we came to look for. In uh, one or two occasions, they got up and said, well, the, the poor old pig can't dodge like we can. It, it really took a bit away from the power of the gun. All we did, and I think it was quite right, was to save our lives and the 90 carriers we had with them. Because once we, my brother and I lost our lives, that would have been definitely the end of all the carriers that we had. They would have been killed out of hand. It would have been a mass slaughter. And we, and as, it, as the, the big chief, he said in his address, we, when we calmed the interpreter down and he told us the whole story, he said that he said to them, they've got all these wonderful things that we need, axes and knives and shell, look at the shell, look at the things that they have. They can't fight like we can. All we can do, all we got to do is to go and just take it off them. Now, when I kill the first one of these white men, when I throw the spear through and, and, and spear with the white men, you die, rush in and grab the people, kill them, and we'll take, we'll, this will be all ours. <laughs> <laughs> well, as he went to throw the spear, Mick shot, but as the whole mob rushed, so did all the Bush guns fire. Well, there was only, only one shot fired, and they, of course they, there was a terrific uh, barrage when the whole, there was about 
Well, it was the order of the day, I suppose. The government allowed you to do it. And anybody who got got uh, uh, killed or wounded, you had to put a report in and that had to be investigated. It wasn't a matter of going along and killing someone and no investigation made. There had to be a government investigation made behind you. There was no such a thing as, a, as you just killing someone and that's the end of it. The administration's attitude was uh, uh, a lot of the people, they didn't, uh, they didn't know much about those things. We never reported those things that happened. I mean, there was, uh, it, it was just one of the things that happened on the trip. But that was a rare occasion, and had we been killed on that trip, there would have been, uh, there we had about 90 carriers with us, and they were all foreign people to these. Well, they would have been all wiped out too. For several years, the Lays searched the Highland Valleys for commercial quantities of gold. They were unsuccessful. They began using aeroplanes on their prospecting expeditions, flying out over unknown country to survey the land before venturing in by foot. It was on one such flight that the Lay brothers first looked down on the Wagi, the biggest valley of them all. Soon after their flight, the Lays walked into this valley and here at last they discovered gold. They set up their final base camp, surrounded by a quarter of a million more people whose existence had not even been suspected by the outside world. There were not so many around the first day, but the next day there was a big crowd arrived. They were all in one long line, and they'd come in with the food and uh, sugar cane and stuff like that, and to show that they were friendly and they wanted to trade with us. But I think they did think that we were something a bit more than ordinary human beings. before we had more food than they ever could hope to, to use. And they were bringing more and more, you couldn't stop them because they just went wild after the trade. 
the beads we had and the shell and the axes. I think out of all the people on our trips, the Hagen people were the easiest and the best of the lot for us to deal with. The big man had come forward and uh, he'd address us. I forget now whether, and I don't think we had a, no, we didn't, we had no interpreters then. But they used to stand up there and give speeches as though we knew every word that they were saying. We'd try to explain to the people that if we didn't want to steal their ground, we just wanted to straighten it out for this big bird to land. Of course, you couldn't talk to them, but you'd have to explain as best we could with sign language. And they helped us. And we used to give them shell and beads and things like that for coming. But they really enjoyed it because they'd sing, sing and dance around. They didn't mind the stamping of the ground to pack it up after we had uh, filled in the drains they had around their gardens. They loved the opportunity to have a big sing sing around the place. And you'd have hundreds of them around sing singing all the time. They tell the natives a few days before that, uh, you know, on, on their hands that so many days that uh, the Barloos had come. They didn't know what a Barloos was. A Barloos was a bird, you see. Well, they said that this bird had come and he'd uh, come out of the air and it would make a noise. They'd make a noise like the plane. I think the thing that struck the most of all was the fact that we could sort of tell them that we'll sleep two or three nights and out of the air will come this bird and it'll fall down here and it'll bring all these things and out of its belly someone will get out. <laughs> I remember the day the first plane arrived on the Wagi Strip. I had a good pair of binoculars and I was watching for the aeroplane and I picked it up about 20 minutes before it landed. And I said, well, here it comes. They were more or less terrified than they what it was. The pilot, Gabaski, was a very tall man, about six foot one or two, and he had a flying suit and a white helmet with these great goggles, and uh, he got out of the plane. Then he opened the door and Kingsbridge and Jolly just take it out of the inside of the plane. There must have been uh, two, three thousand natives lined up along the airstrip. And they were absolutely amazed, the people, and, and just <laughs> looked up with wonderment. They didn't know what next was going to happen. I 
Tora. Let you on in a cheapy apocalypse in a minimum Rikaki. Now, my little Rikaro hopping in a key. Now, man, who could never put him and never Koroka or whatever the Kuriker or what is up the Koherevan and another Wakiniki, Abel of Kunike. Your term is Rev and another Wakin Abel of Kunike. Are a Sanuko. So now, Maruba Arocama, Roca, Toruba, Rocama, Kukon, and the Tomana Mutivoco. No, you I'm looking on the bright side, though I'm walking in the shade, sticking out my chest, hoping for the best, looking on the bright side of life. I'm waiting for the right tide, and if luck comes to my aid, giving me a break, I shall be awake, looking on the bright side of life. Today I'm in the shadow, tomorrow maybe the clouds will lift and let the sun shift over to me. I'm looking on the bright side, though today's all care and strife, I can wear a grin, keeping up my chin, looking on the bright side of life. ก็เลยกันเนี่ยจ้าตัวเนี่ยเกลียดมันเป็นนายโมก็ไปอีเดียโมก็ไปเอาอะไรเจ็บปุ่มมันก็เกิดเป็นอะไรเจ็บปุ
the best prospect we had stuck in all our trips. So we had to wait till the geologists came out and our engineers came out from well to examine it. It was quite wonderful, really, the thought of what we might get, because the El Dorado was always at the end of our trip. Mick decided that, that, that one of them should go down and see what, how we did live down there, that we weren't all walking around guarding guns and protecting ourselves and all that. So we spoke to the Kanakas and said, what about coming? And they said, no, we won't go. But in the end, they allowed one of the kids to go. You bring all the time, all the time, come here. Emil is a man. 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 Emil is a and he took him down to the ocean and salt was the thing that they were always short of up in the highlands. And they said, well, taste it. And uh, the boy tasted it and then he said, get me some bottles and I'll fill them up. They'd found out bottles. So he filled up some bottles of water and tied them up because he wanted to take them back because he said, when I get back, they won't believe me that there's so much of this. Well, then he saw a horse, a young, small horse, and he said, pig, pig. So uh, they said, I oh, know horse. Well, he'd never heard of a horse before. So he said, well, give me a bit of its tail and a bit of it here and there. So as I can say, well, look, here it is, and here's a bit of it, you see. So he got a bit of that. And the same with everything else. When he went into his shop, he'd take things, because he didn't know anything about paying or buying or anything like that. So they said, well, give it to him. And so, of course, he, had, he landed back eventually after four or five days. They didn't keep him there very long because they wanted to get him back whole, or otherwise it could have been very nasty if he hadn't got back. And when he got back, he had all these things, you see, and he said, uh, um, he started to tell them. And he said, there's a bar loose. He said, this one has only got one here, but he said, there's one down there, it's got one zzz, and one zzz, and one zzz, <laughs> and he said, uh, there's pigs as big as this, and, and you know, the salt, he said, you know, as far as the eye can see, you know, it's full of water, full of salt, and, you know, tasted it, they tasted it, and, and you know, the lap lap uh, clothing and things like that, oh, there's plenty of it. And nobody has a gun, they all walk about, and everybody's sort of friendly, and, and of course, they didn't believe him, and they said, oh, it can't be that good. So they all wanted to get in the plane and go there. <laughs> Well, they were real bush kanakas, and they were very primitive. They had never worked at any job before. See, it was always hard to get labour for plantations and mining on the coast. But for mining in the island, where there was only one miner, well, it wasn't very hard to get them. There'd be hundreds of applications for a few jobs. Before me, pra one one man yeti possim. Now, there's a person finishing now, there's a wet pra money come. A more of Luana to return possim pra rocket. Or yet he took a walk, me place I hold him walk. Now, yet he makin terong table hold him walk, and there's a time he plain of Popaja Habilism, we place I be an him. And there's a time he plain of buying pest for money, money to me plain of look savvy. Na mi pratintin do kumukumuna, taibum na santibu sorvada, kinana, 
Es muy rollo ser santita, solo me pregué aquí. I think for one shell they do about a month's work. We used to order it from Thursday Island and then be flown in. Sometimes we get a thousand there. Wealth was the great thing, the big thing in their life. They judged a man by the number of pigs and the number of shells he had, mostly. Although it wasn't in El Dorado, we were millionaires or anything like that, or anything like millionaires. We'd made a very, very good living out of it. We were able to pay the natives well for everything, and that was the main thing in the country, to be able to give them, to barter fairly with them all the time, and we were to more than fairly. But I don't think there was anything in the, the native way of life 
as far as developing the country or for their own good, that was uh, that they had anything that was better than what they have now. It was no good trying to say we weren't old colonials, we were. And I can remember there was a fellow who came up there and he was in business and someone called him a robber one day, a European this was. Well, he said, I didn't come up here to get a suntan. <laughs> So, you know, I think everybody was the same. It's no good for me trying to make out I went up there for the good of the natives, because I did. I went up there for the good of James Levy Lay. I didn't do too badly. Make <laughs> 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 I'm going to go Keeping up the chin, looking on the bright side of 